Hello, everyone. Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is the week in charts. Today is October 27, 2022, by the way. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. Looks like our numbers are continuing to grow, so somebody's finding the show. If you're watching this on YouTube, number one, thank you. And if you like it, like it. And if you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> and subscribe if you don't mind but if you would like to attend live bring your stock picks and your questions we do these every thursday right now at 6 p.m eastern or 7 p.m eastern 6 central and you can register at davelander.com slash webinar register even if the date is old so what are we talk about well obviously current market conditions i'll have a lot to say about that your favorite stock and crypto picks questions on trading i still had to fix that slide what a bummer and so we're going to focus on well and cora imparo and that'll make sense in a minute and that just says i'm still learning thanks for the ogre and the fractal nature of patterns where are we now i want to do an update on that so a lot of charts in the chart show tonight what a concept there's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. One thing I think about often is Encora and Paro, and this is alleged. Allegedly, Michelangelo said this at 87, and it's Greek or Italian, or roughly translated, it means yet I am still learning, or I am still learning. I think Encora means also, I am still learning. And allegedly was by Michelangelo when he was 87 years old. And as I've said before, years ago, I worked with a day trader to help him find setups. And I was pretty amazed that over a period of about six months, even though he'd been trading for a long, long time, I saw him get better and better and better. And it was a pretty amazing thing to see that even after you're doing this for a long time, you could find yourself getting getting better and better. Now, my core methodology just has minor tweaks along the way. The core methodology, for those who are not familiar, familiar with the methodology, is swing to intermediate term. And the way we get to that intermediate term or longer is through the money management by taking partial profits. And we've got one in the portfolio now, which is coming up on two years, or maybe a couple of months shy of two years, but we're getting there. And that all started with swing trade, and we were able to hold that throughout the bear market, not because we're obstinate or stupid, but because we didn't get stopped out. So I am slowly learning stuff there. Now, when it comes to the intraday trading, I'm definitely learning more and more there because I haven't done that for 30 something years. Whereas in general, I've been a trend follower and a position trader for that long. And it took a while, but I did learn what needs to be done and when to do it. Now, in more recent years, I've done, a, I've gotten a little bit more active, even though I preach against that. But my argument is I'm here anyway. If I see money along the corner, I should go over and pick it up. Now, a lot of times I don't do that, but I should. So I want to show you something here that I've done recently, to, actually this week to kind of improve things. Now, keep in mind that I, I don't want to be in and out, in and out like the rabbit well, the rat going for the cocaine with the day trading. And I'm trying to back off from it quite a bit and do less and less. And less is definitely more. And if I sit around and wait for something like an ogre and individual issues, like we're going to talk about in a few minutes, and especially in the overall market as far as the intraday trading is concerned, I'll do really well. And then I can go back to sitting on my hands. Now, one thing I experimented with a while back and I saw something recently that reminded me of it was changing the color of the bars. Now, before I get to that, just let me show you something real quick. I've told the story a thousand times, so I'll tell it just once more. About, I guess it was probably about two years ago, I was kind of chasing my own tail with the E-mini trading. And I remember one week I came in and I didn't have any trades for like on a Monday and a Tuesday and Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then finally, I think by Thursday, I got a trade and it worked. And 
The next week, same sort of thing happened again. I'm like, well, that's weird. Normally, I'm going, I'm chasing this thing up and down, up and down, and I have to back off, and then I get back in, and then finally, it's like I finally eke out a little bit, but I get chewed up so much, I really question whether or not it's worth it. So what happened was I couldn't figure out why I had backed off of my trades, but more importantly and more excitingly was the fact that my trading had gotten better. And then it dawned on me, I think into the second week, that I had accidentally changed my charts from a five minute chart to a 15 minute chart. So let me just rephrase that. So what had happened inadvertently was I changed my five minute chart to a 15 minute chart. And all of a sudden a bar that looked like this just was kind of like a regular size bar. And I found myself trading less and less and less, and the fake outs didn't look as huge. If you look down at like a five minute bar, it looks like you got this huge breakout. And as I've said, I think last week or said before, when I'm down to a one minute chart, I call it the one minute warning, something is wrong, and I probably just need to get out of the position. But anyway, long story endless, I accidentally changed my time frame up. Now, I've gotten chewed up in more recent times. And so I thought to myself, why not go from a 15 minute to a 30 minute, especially in something like e minis, which could be pretty noisy. Now I do flip back and forth between 15 and 30 minutes now on the ETF, such as LabU, LabD, Gush, Drip, JDUG, JDust, and what's the other one I'm leaving out? SoxS and SoxL. I tend to focus on those four. But anyway, by going to a higher time frame, especially the S&P 500, I was able to filter out some of the noise and not get so excited on these, what appears to be these huge wide range bars. Now, something I experimented with a while back and recently I saw somebody talking about it, I don't remember who it was, but it's something I experimented with and said, you know what, let me try that again. So, when you have the, the red bars and the green bars like this with the candles, when you have a, a sell-off, it turns red. And from a psychological standpoint, that, that is doing something to you by seeing that big red bar. Now, I haven't made any changes on the daily charts, nor do I see any reason to do that to kind of muck up my core methodology. So I'm going to keep things as they are. But on intraday stuff, I've been experimenting with this, with this because you get a red bar and you think, oh, my God, it's the end of the world. And then all of a sudden you see this green bar, you think, man, this is the mother of all trends. And then you're like, nope, it's the end of the world when you see that red bar again. Now where I'm going with all this was to remove the filling of the bars and just use hollow candles, whether it's up or down. And I have found that by doing that, and, and I'm only one weekend, so check back often, but if you look at the bars by doing that, basically we're just in a trading range. Now I know the old me, especially if I was looking at a 50 minute chart, would have chased this market down, got stopped out, chased it up, got stopped out, chased it down, got stopped out. And then God knows what I've done after that. But the new improved version is looking at these charts and saying, okay, it looks like it's trying to break out, but let's just see what happens. And then nope, it comes back in. And I think especially one thing I've noticed, and, and maybe you guys can let me know how you feel about this or, or whether you've experienced the same thing, but I find that after a bar is completed, whatever that time period is, let's say it's a 10-minute a bar, a 15-minute bar, that next bar that comes up, you tend to be fixated on whether it's red or green because it's turned red to green, red to green, red to green. And I think a lot of things are lighting up in your brain that are kind of tricking you to think, oh, it's bullish, oh, it's bearish. So this is just, this is an experiment in process, a work in progress. I'm a work in progress as, as, as all traders I think are, but I think it's something that, that needs to be fleshed out. I think from a psychological standpoint, there's a lot more to it. And again, I'm not changing anything the way I do on a daily chart. In fact, I just, I just use, I don't use red and green bars at all on a daily chart. I, I don't think I ever did. I just use a regular old bar chart. I do like to use the candle charts intraday just because it makes it easier to see the bar especially now that i'm getting a little older and my eyes are getting worse anyway it's just something I'm, I'm kind of noodling with going up a time frame especially when the market can become really really choppy to try to keep me out of especially something like s&p trading because s&ps are 
a very noisy market and you can get into a lot of trouble really, really fast. And the ranges on this bar that I'm showing you here on this day were just ridiculous. And each bar is just like a, a huge range, like 30 or 40 points. And you can get chewed up really quick. Now, there might be somebody who's much better at me and more scalper oriented when it comes to scalping or something that could just jump on these things and ride them out. But that's not my goal. My goal is to, to get into an intraday trade and ride it all day long. Hopefully, I know we're just never using this business, but hopefully let my trailing stop and my limit order take me out at the IPT and then follow it higher all day long to where I can be very, very, very hands off. Now, each week I like to show you some trading that I did for the week. And sometimes I'll try to get some trades in on Thursday just so I can show you what I did the day of the chart show, especially since it's still fresh for me. And the trading that I've done over the last couple of days, for the most part, a lot of it, I think you would think I was maybe chasing my own tail because in a lot of cases, because the market has been so noisy lately, uh, in some cases I've gotten out more quickly, just not looking that gift horse in the mouth. And $100 here, $100 there. And I don't know if that's teachable, but the ultimate goal is to get into these intraday trends and ride them. So hopefully that made some sense. And I'll show you an ogre trade here in just one second. Before we do that, I want to do a quick VIX update. And the VIX has been kind of interesting. And the thing that's been interesting is it's it's getting stretched in here away from the moving average. Now remember, when it gets stretched to the downside, mark, the market tends to sell off, okay? And when it gets stretched to the upside, the market tends to rally because the, the it's kind of a fear index that some people look at it. And as the market becomes more and more complacent and the VIX falls off, then it's like the top, the, the clock is ticking for a big move to the downside or a sizable move to the downside. Now, somebody on one of my YouTube videos pointed out that you don't get such explosions in the VIX after the market has been an extended downtrend. So I find that kind of interesting. I think that's some fodder for research and I've been meaning to take a look at that. But as I've been saying, the, the moves to the upside are more impressive than the moves to the downside in the VIX itself, if you're trading the VIX. But anyway, I think what I'm seeing lately is volatility is coming off in the market. And I think in general, this is a good sign, even though the VIX getting stretched to the downside is kind of a bearish thing. I think the moving average is rushing to catch up with it. So you can see we're getting stretched down around 10% here. But again, the moving average is kind of rushing to catch up with it. So the normalization is coming down. Remember a while back, we talked about how the... VIX was normalizing to the upside. Now it's beginning to normalize a little bit to the downside. So if you do ever play the VIX intraday, and that's what we've been talking about quite a bit lately, just make sure that you wait for a move to actually happen in the VIX. So you can see today we had a super, super narrow range. And I've been saying, based on this little range indicator, you can see the formula over there, over here, just high minus low divided by yesterday's 10-day ATR expressed as a percentage. You don't need to understand all that other than it just tells you how much the move, the VIX has moved today, high minus low. You can't trade the, you can't trade a gap overnight, obviously. So it's high minus low if you're intraday trading, obviously. So it needs to be 50% or more ideally before you look to take some sort of action. And the ultimate goal, like on a day like this day, even though it wasn't set up but the ultimate goal you can see is to catch something like a 250 percent move compared to the average move on the vix all right any questions on the vix before we move on to ogre trading i just want to show you that it's been low for a while and, and here's the perverse nature of the markets it's like i've been trying to catch the short side all afternoon of this market and what happens Two minutes after the close, the market implodes, right after I exit all the day trades. So that's kind of the aggravating part of this all. And so we're going to get that reversion to the mead move probably overnight. 
in the VIX, which kind of stinks. But anyway, I think that's going to be based on the Amazon earnings. All right, let's talk about trading the opening gap reversals. Now, today, Hal in the Facebook group pointed out the CMC SA as a possible ogre. And I was in the process of getting ready for the pitch, which should appear on YouTube on Stock Charts channel. So take a look at that if you get really bored. And uh, if not for me, for the other people that were on today, Joe Rabel and Aaron Swerlin, and they did a really good job on the show. But anyway, so I was kind of tied up with that. And of course, uh, interesting things happen while I'm busy tied up with other stuff. Sit here, you know, hours of boredom interrupted by brief moments for sheer panic. Now, for a downside opening gap reversal, I want to see a downtrend. I want to see a pullback. And I have my scans set for greater than 5% up. Now, I did not see this one, but it was a or is a very thick stock, very liquid stock. And a very well-known stock, this is Comcast. And I like well-known stocks for opening gap reversal plays because you got a lot of players in the market. You got a lot of players trapped on the wrong side of the market. It's sort of just the opposite of what I like to do. Although I will trade big cap stocks. I think that ARLP is pretty, pretty big. And I will trade stocks with a lot of volume, but ideally I want to trade stocks that are a little bit thinner within reason. And that's because it can be a little bit more efficient. But for an opening gap reversal, it's kind of just the opposite as I preach. And this is a big, thick stock, which kind of fits the bill for that. So do we have a downtrend? Well, yes, we do. We have a pullback, but the gap was less than 5%. And that's why I didn't see it in my scans. So here's your downtrend. And there's your pullback. Okay. And then the gap, as I said, was not greater than 5%. Now, what would the world be without hypothetical questions? I did catch a piece here, but would I have caught a bigger piece had I not been distracted by the webinar? Who knows? And, and you know, you can make the same argument. Other times when I'm in a webinar, maybe that saved me from losing money from watching those flickering ticks and getting tickeritis. Now, notice that it gapped higher and then immediately rallied. I do I do like when opening gap reversals go up. I kind of like them to fake out a little bit to the downside, provided they don't catch me in the fake out, go up and then come down and trigger. Now, if you're trading this in kind of a textbook manner, and let's go back to the daily chart. If you're trading them in a textbook manner, you want to trade below the gap somewhere plus some wiggle room, okay? So you almost want to, and I would encourage you, especially if you're new to the opening gap reversal, and I'll show you one way to maybe get in a little earlier in a second. But if you're new to them, I would encourage you to just trade them off the daily chart so you don't get too caught up in the zigs and zags. So like today, this thing opened, might have dipped a little bit. You wouldn't have got too caught up in that. And then all of a sudden, you got this big old fat rally, you're like, aha. So I'm going to put my entry with a little wiggle room down here somewhere. It's going to be a little bit further than what I'm getting ready to show you. So anyway, gaps higher begins to take off after just this little blip down, which hopefully didn't suck you in. And this is a 50-minute chart, by the way. So you're going to enter below that low plus a wiggle room. Now, the point I was trying to make earlier is if you're entering off a daily chart, that wiggle room is going to be a little bit bigger. And I would encourage you, again, to trade off daily charts if you're going to trade these open gap reverse situations. And then you're less likely to get caught up in noise alone. So you can see that even a very small amount of wiggle room would have kept you from getting sucked in on this trade. And then you can see it immediately reversed and went straight back up. So that was a fake out. And then it kind of did a fake out of the fake out, which we'll get to in one second, and began to trend lower. Now. As I'll show you in one second, maybe after it makes all its opening gyrations, then you could possibly enter a little higher. But a textbook way to play them 
would be below the gap plus a little wiggle room like I've shown here. Now, what happened with me was, like I said, I was busy with the webinar and all. And when I checked later in the day, I, I, I did the show and immediately after the show, I was really hungry. So I went and ate lunch and I had forgotten about this Comcast. And then later in the day, I'm looking at it and it's like, you know, this thing looks like it's still in trouble and it seems to be trending lower and the overall market seemed to be reversing and heading lower. So I said, you know what? I think it's worth an S G kind of short. Like I said earlier, I kind of like to throw in a trade on Thursday that I could show you Thursday night to say, hey, look, I did this. So I just kind of did it in S and G size, which you could argue could be a dangerous thing. And it's like the other thing you could argue is like, well, sh should I have just let this trade go because I missed that earlier entry? And I just felt like it was headed lower, it looked like it was in trouble, and maybe it would go down further to close that gap so i just threw on a couple hundred shares so it, it wouldn't matter hugely to me one way or the other and if it really did implode then i'd have on a couple hundred shares and i didn't have initially put an ipt but i i think i was had an ipt of my in mind of uh of one point and what i did was i just wrote it to the close because it generally moved in my favor and then I exited right around the close, as you can see from this, from these trades up here, okay? And this was in central time. So 14.59 is right before the close. 1500 will be the close in central time. So there you can see shorted at 31.94 and exited at, 32.40 for a 45-cent gain. Multiply that times 200 shares. Woohoo! 90 whole dollars. Well, doing my fuzzy math, if you make $90 extra a day, that's an extra 22,600. Now I know that's not reality, <laughs> you know, but I think it's important to annualize, especially on the downside, okay? So let's say you go in and you're doing something S&G like this and you lose $90. Well, that's the same as losing $22,000 a year if you did that every day. So I think it's okay to think in terms of annualization to get your risk in line. But again, I didn't put on a huge trade here because it was kind of an S&G thing. I was kind of late and I did want to show you that, hey, you can trade these opening gap reversals. Now, in an ideal world, again, I would have liked to have seen a 5% or more gap, but I figure this is a big, thick stock. And within the stock's volatility, the gap seemed fairly big. And, and, and maybe there's some fodder for research. Your gap size could be based on the stock's normal volatility. And you might just be able to use something like 50-day HV as a reference on that. And I'm not sure exactly what that would look like, but I know this stock just eyeballing it looks like the volatility is a little bit lower than uh, a lot of the other stocks out there. So maybe that gap was sizable based on the volatility. I'm just thinking out loud as I go through this. But anyway, a little trade today. I really wanted to show you a VIX trade because that's something I've really been uh, excited about lately, but nothing has set up. So I'm, being careful not to force the issue. And the other thing too is with this trade, I had to really think through it. Like, am I doing this just to do it because I want to have something to show you guys tonight or is this thing really sinking and is it a worthwhile trade? And I came to the conclusion that, yeah, I think it's worth a shot, but since it's already moved so far, let's not bet the form on it. Now, if you were to trade these, again, I would encourage you to start trading them in a textbook manner. And then, and by the way, throw them out on Facebook. I appreciate that because I, I, I didn't see this one. It wasn't in my scans and I picked up a few bucks, better than the poke in the eye, right? Pizza party tonight or tomorrow night or whenever. But throw them out there and I'll, I'll come in with my two cents as I did today on this one. So obviously we had that first bar was a fake out, kind of a fake out of the fake out. It faked out higher and then it faked out lower. And I kind of like that. I like to see people get jerked around a little bit. And 
not that I enjoy that. I'm not being shot on Friday because a lot of times I'm getting jerked around. But as a technician, you've got to look at the psychology of the market and think, okay, if I was in this market long, all of a sudden it implodes, I'm freaking out and wanting to dump. And then if I'm a short and this thing begins to implode, you're like, ah, I'm vindicated. Or you might also be thinking if you're not a short, but you're bearish, you want to jump on. And then it kind of, it kind of zigzags back and forth. It kind of flushes out everyone. And then it makes its real true move lower. Now it faked out to the upside, looked like it was gonna keep on keeping on by making new highs for the day. And then there was another fake out lower or that fake out turned out to be the real deal. We didn't know it at the time, but notice it began to trend lower. So maybe a better entry in a case like this would have been like, aha, we're not all the way down to that gap area, that opening range, so to speak. But it looks like we're beginning to implode in earnest here. We've dropped for, how long is that? About an hour and a half or so. And it's making new lows. So maybe that's the time to play that breakdown a little bit later in the day. And you could always stop out, let's say above the high of the day, and then maybe go about your life. And that's the beauty of these ogre trades. And that's my, would, would be my ultimate goal is just put on these ogres, you know, check the markets in the morning, and see if there's any opening gap reversal trades, and unless it's the mother of all opening gap reversals in the overall market, go off and have some fun, and then come back at the end of the day and see how these things shake out. And if it's an ogre trade or something, you know, put on a yoga trade, put in my orders, and then go off and have fun. And I've done that before. It's just in more recent times, I have a, a show with stock charts, I have a guest appearance somewhere, which I'm all grateful for. Don't don't get me wrong. But I tend to be here more, and that's there's a danger in that that I'm able to watch the screen too much sometimes. And as I preach, busy traders make good traders because you only want to take you only take the best trades because you're so busy doing everything else. And I've told a story at nausea, but one of my clients, he said, my trade just got a little better. I'm like, well, what did you do? You figure out some kind of uh, indicator or something? He's like, no, my uh, nurse, actually his doctor, his doctor at the hospital quit. And he had to take over her shift. So he was literally working day and nights and didn't have time to trade. And he would only take the best of the best opportunities. So anyway, that's why I always preach busy traders make good traders. My problem is I'm busy here, surrounded by <laughs> five now. I've got one waiting to be put in. All right, any questions on all that? I do have the question window working again. A few weeks back, I talked about the fractal nature of patterns. And as I've said before, I've got one of my clients who's been a client forever. Thank you, Jim. And he likes to look at 60-minute turns, more specifically the 60-minute bow tie, to help him with his market timing. Now, you're going to get more whipsaw if you're just looking at a 60-minute chart. But you're also occasionally going to get out at nearly the exact top of the market. Like I showed a couple of weeks ago, the bow tie to the downside on the hourly chart would have would have triggered, okay, or at least the proper order would have flipped over like the half a day into the what would become the top of the market. So the market makes a top, and like the next day or the day after, I forget, you can look at the 60-minute chart and see you had a bow tie to the downside of the 60-minute chart. So what Jim likes to do is he gets that first little signal and says, you know what, I'm out. I can always get back in. And that's fine. I think you got to be a little careful if you're going to do some longer term market timing, not to, to drill down too far. But I think he's on to something and he's got me looking at hourly charts. And, and I learn a lot from you guys. And that's why I love doing this. And 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 thanks to Hal today for the over trade. It's like, you know what? I think I might take that. So it's a symbiotic relationship. And this is one reason I love teaching some more. And this is so much. And this is why the, the Facebook group has been so great. And it's, it's good for us to all see what I'm going off on a tangent. I love you, man. But it's good for us to all see that we do have our struggles. We do have our ups and downs. And one of the main things that, that I think is pretty amazing, too, is this stuff is repeatable. OK, we can look at that 60 minute chart and say, well, this might not this might not be the top of the market, but it's a top of the market. We can look at an opening gap reversal and say, hey, this is a cool little 
little day trade. I'm not going to bet the forum, but you know what? I'll throw in a couple hundred shares for S and Gs, and I'm going to follow a plan and have a stop and have an IPT in place and get out by the end of the day. And it might turn out to be something pretty cool. Anyway, before I digress too far, imagine that, me digress. Notice on the 60 minute chart, we do have Landry Light to the upside, at least we did. And we had 30, this is a 60 minute chart. So we had 30 hours or thereabouts of upside Landry Light. And then the market pulls back to the 30 EMA. And now you have zero Landry Light. Remember when it intersects the bars, you have zero. When the lows are higher, you have a count of one. And then each low that's higher, you count, keep counting higher and higher. And again, a lot of people get tricked up on this. I know you guys know, but in case you're new to this show or watching on YouTube, this down here does not measure magnitude. I've actually had so many people, well, I'd say so many, there's about three or four people who couldn't get past that part of the quizzes on the back end of the site in the course, in the members courses, because I kind of try to trick them up. This is not magnitude, it just kind of looks like that. And by the way, one thing you can do, not that you could time off of this, but when you start seeing an extended trend and it gets pretty high, especially like in the market, if you see like 90 weeks of trend, and I think 90 is the kind of the magic number, it might be 100, but you can look at the weekly charts and see, usually the market is due for a correction. So it's kind of like, okay, let's just be careful in here. We've had 90 weeks of upside Landry light. We're probably due for some sort of correction. And hopefully that doesn't become something bigger than just a correction. But anyway, if you're looking at like a Landry light pullback, I would look to get long. I used a spider tonight so we can use an actual tradable market as opposed to cash. But I would look to get long around 385 in the spiders, okay? Now I know we're gonna get whacked overnight because of Amazon. But I thought it was cool. And again, I would never would have seen this had it not been for you guys and had not been doing a webinar tonight or teaching. But it's, I think it's pretty cool that you've got a Landry Light pullback setting up. And Landry Light pullback is just at least 10 bars higher and a pullback to the moving average and ideally 20 bars or more. So you get a little bit more established trend. And I like the Landry Light over something like ADX because it's, it's going to be a lot faster to catch up with trend. And it's also gonna be a lot quicker to change because as soon as you touch a moving average, it goes back to zero and it resets. Now it might go back to green, which is fine, but it gives you an idea where you are. You can see it went from green to zero, green to zero, zero, zero to red, zero, zero, then back to green. Well, never forget to look at the market. What did the market do then? Well, the market went absolutely sideways. So I'm just, again, I'm kind of learning again, but maybe. In my S&P trading, my E-mini trading, maybe I need to keep this Landry Light chart up and say, aha, we're just going sideways in here. This big old fat bar you're seeing intraday, let's say on a 15 minute bar chart or whatever, now I'm, I'm up to 30 on the, on the P's, but let's say I'm still watching 50. Maybe that's not such a big deal because the market is just chopping back and forth, okay? Now let's take a look at the bow ties. And they are beginning to roll over in here, but so far, you could argue that the uptrend remains intact based on the bow tie order. And down here, if the 10 is greater than 20 and the 20 is greater than 30, these are simple exponential and exponential respectively. It's gonna be green. If there's any intersection, it's gonna be yellow. And if they're in downtrend proper order, meaning that the 10 is less than 20 and 20 is less than 30, it's gonna be red. And by accident, I said, well, red for down and green for up. And program was like, what about in between? And I think he might've came up with yellow. I don't remember if I came up with yellow or not, but it's pretty damn cool that it's kind of this red light, green light, yellow light. Now it's, it's a little bit more complex than that when it comes to trading, but boy, this is a great place to start, okay? As long as you have green, look to get long. If you have yellow, you might want to be cautious about getting long or short. And if you have lots of red, you might want to think about getting short. And if you got green and red, green and red, green and red, back and forth with some yellow in between, then you know you have a choppy market. So anyway, hourly chart, there's the pullback on the hourly chart. 
nice little trend vis-a-vis -vis the Landry lights and then a pullback. The question is, is Landry proper order available in Metastock? Yeah, Paul, it's actually free in Metastock, believe it or not. It is. Um, some of these things are called something different, but just look for my indicators with Dave Landry on them. I call them indicators as as I preach. I see them more as illustrators. They sort of illustrate what's happening in the chart. So never forget to look at the chart. So you can see here, as I said, I think last week, or at least in my Trading Simplified show, you had a green, but that was, you had that one gap up after it turned green. Now, of course, it would have been great if you got long for that gap up, but it never did take out that high, even though it stayed green for a while and it came back in. And you can see nice little pullback there. So we got a pullback on the 60 minute chart. That's looking pretty good. This is likely gonna change tomorrow though, with the late day action or after hours action, I should say. Now I thought it'd be kind of cool and I know you wanna party with me. But I thought it'd be kind of cool to look at a four hour chart. And you can see that it's kind of sloppy, but it is a bow tie. A bow tie is when you go from uptrend downtrend to downtrend proper order or downtrend to uptrend proper order rather quickly. In other words, you have very little yellow in between, given the appearance of the bow tie. But you can see you've got a nice little uptrend developing, and then you got a pullback too. So four-hour charts looking pretty good there. Now, getting back to the the red light, yellow light, green light, you can see we were in a downtrend. We turned yellow. Hey, maybe things are improving. No, they're not. Maybe so. Yes, they are. Okay. And just by paying attention to the green and the yellow, I mean, look at this on a four hour chart. Going back to August, we had that really nice rally in August, nice green, all of a sudden, wait a minute, we're starting to meander back and forth in here. Well, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon and say, well, we did gap lower and we we're also making lower lows and this stays yellow on the cusp of turning red. Oh, turn red, maybe the market's in trouble. So it kind of illustrates what's happening and that in and of itself, might help to keep you out of trouble. Now, we don't have a daily bow tie just yet. You can see we're still red in here. And again, always look at the chart. Just because it's red doesn't mean the market's gonna keep going down. Maybe looking at price, the price, the trend has turned. Well, we had this beautiful opening gap reversal here. This is probably, probably my best day of the year so far. <laughs> but believe me, I don't wanna brag because I got chopped up a lot in this bear market, the choppy trading that we've been having lately. But this was a really good day because we had that flush out to the downside. So this feels like a temporary bottom. I don't wanna call a bottom in the overall market, but this feels like a temporary bottom. If we take this out, I will definitely say we're still in a pretty serious bear market. We're still in a bear market now and the trend's still down, but we have seen some improvement as of late. And I don't know where the after hours trading is now, but after hours trading notwithstanding, thanks to the Amazon debacle. But you can see the moving averages are coming together. Now remember, with an exponential moving average, and I learned this from Greg Morris, as soon as you close above it, the moving average will turn up. Whether it's a 10-day a exponential, a 100-day exponential, or a 1,000-day exponential, it actually will turn up. And um, I think I made the mistake of saying, are you sure, Greg? And he says, it's mathematics. I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay. If Greg says it turns up, it turns up. Now, the simple moving average can take a little while to catch up the price, but that lag up can actually work to our advantage. And on shorter term time frames, like a five day simple or five day or 10 day, I do like a, a, a simple moving average as opposed to an exponential moving average. But you can see the simple has begun to turn up too. And I think if you use exponentials with the bow ties, you would get a lot more noise. I think the, the simple aspect kind of smooths out the the bow ties and keeps you from getting too much noise related type signals. I never did try them with exponential. I know some people have, and uh, I'd be curious to see what you find with that. But if memory serves, every time I like accidentally put in a 10 exponential, it, it tends to give you too many signals. It tends to be real jagged every time you get a turn because the 10 day simple, when you get a close above it, it might still be going down, but it's, it'll slow going down. Whereas if you had a 10 day exponential, it would have a jagged up right straight back up. And I don't think it would work as well. 
So George says risk under flush low. I think if you were super brave, you could put a stop below that low. This kind of scares me. If we get below this low, it, it's gonna it's gonna scare me. But if we gap way below that low, maybe it's just another flush out. So I don't know, George, but I would keep an eye on that. That is a temporary bottom for now. I would never call the end of a bear market on one day. But so far, it looks like that. And today I was asked for longer term predictions. And as I often tell people, especially now that my phone's beginning to ring because people are freaking out about the markets, they want to know where it's going to be in the year, next year, whatever. I'm like, I don't know. I'm a trend follower, okay? Some people call me a trend following moron. In fact, if you go to at T following moron, you can find me on Twitter. Let's take a look at a weekly chart. So this is kind of a beautiful thing. And I know I'm a nerd, but notice that really nice trend we had last year coming into this bear market. We had lots and lots of green for the bow tie proper order. Okay. So again. This is a weekly chart. Not that you want to make all your decisions off of this, but hey, you know what? When you turn yellow, hmm, maybe things are beginning to change. Maybe the market's consolidating. It might be catching its breath, but it might also be in trouble. So that's a point where you might want to let off the gas a little bit, maybe even tap the brakes, you know, <laughs> following with that metaphor, and certainly pay attention. Now, here's the other cool thing that I've been preaching quite a bit. You don't have unlimited time to get out of the way, but you do have time. That's another thing that Greg Morris taught me is that even though market crashes, bear markets seem like a big crash, okay? It's like, oh, the market crashed. Well, those crashes, even 1987, have never happened, never say never, but have never happened right after brand new highs. Doesn't mean that the market can't sell off after new highs, but air on the side of the market. And maybe that's in the back of my head when I developed the TFM 10% system to where you don't exit the market till at least a 10% drop just in case it's correcting. But as I've been saying, and cash looks a little bit different, it might be one week off. But let's just count this as, let's count this as week one because it made a new high and came back in or start with the closing high. All time highs here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. So you got eighteen or nineteen weeks before this market begins to really come unglued a little bit. So you do have some time to get out of the way. And I did purposely build a little lag into that TFM 10% system. And luckily, so far, I mean, but who knows what will happen. I forget how many years it's been out, three years now, maybe four. But looking back 100 years, every crash has had a more gradual rollover than you would imagine. And that system with that lag built in with the 50-week moving average and, and a 10% line, 10% below the 50-week closing high, has been a really good time to exit the markets. Of course, there's some whipsaws here and there, and I'll show you one in one second. But it has been a really good time historically to get out of the way. And I would encourage you, if you can't sleep at night, go in and watch last week's Dave Landry's The Week of Charts, where I showed the, and it's, it's on my website tonight, but it'll be further into the back end tomorrow. And But you can find it on YouTube youtube.com slash c slash Dave Landry if it's not on the back of the website. But anyway, I would encourage you to go in and watch the presentations that I did on the TFM 10% system. There's nothing new to really report this week, so I wanted to back off on that a little bit. But anyway, you can see we went red, and then we had a little yellow in between, and then we went back to red. George says that chart's... A chart looks setting up uh, is a short, okay. Um, well, this low here is not tremendously below this low here, but yeah, put a gun to my head, long or short, I would say short. But you can see we are starting to push into those moving averages, okay. 
So it has been improving last couple of weeks, but we'll see where we end up this week, okay? But yeah, as I was, you know, I feel like when I'm doing my nightly service, or talking on these webinars, it, it's like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth because the longer term trend is still down. Nothing has changed. So if that's somewhat of the question you're asking or the question, is the trend still down? Absolutely. But shorter term, in general, things have begun to improve. But I'm a trend follower, so check back often. And I will be a little late to become bullish, although I'm, I'm showing you on these Shorter term charts, like the hourly chart, even though it's pulling back, it's still bullish. Now, if it keeps pulling back, then no capital's put in harm's way. You just let the thing roll right back over. So anyway, nice green, longer term uptrend, followed by a period of caution, followed by a period of mostly red. It all looks so easy in hindsight, but the reality is, it was there all along. You know, let's unpack that. There's a lot there to unpack. But the point I'm making is something like TFM 10% system, bow ties, Landry Light, whatever you want to use, use your own stuff, or just look at the net net price change. That could keep you out of a lot of trouble. And I had a friend once, I hate to pick on him, because I checked the stock. I, I could barely could find a stock anymore, and I found it on some bulleted board somewhere, or it's a bulletin board stock now. And it was like a Penny and a third, and he had bought the stock. I forget what the levels like 50 and 40 and 30 and 20 and all this other stuff. And he showed me all his buys, and I drew a big blue arrow on a chart. He goes, Well, that's in hindsight. It's like, Well, you're the one that bought it. I'll give you the first buy, okay? But you bought it when it dropped 10 points, and when it dropped 20 points, and when it dropped 30 points, and then he bought it when it was down a penny stock. He put more and more money in it, and now it's it appears to be delisted. I'm not sure what's going on with that company, but. I think it's bankrupt, or I don't know if it exists or not. It certainly doesn't exist in, in, a, in a tradable market anymore. So although some of this stuff may seem like hindsight, if you follow along at home, and this is not, I know I'm preaching to the choir here tonight, but if you go back and look at last August, August 25th, I believe, I did a show on, hey, this is what a sell signal is going to look at. The markets look like, the market's at new highs now, but if this happens and this happens, we're going to have a sell signal. And you go back to March or whenever that sell signal triggered, it's like, hey, here's the sell signal. Now, the daily chart, this is one thing I showed earlier today in the pitch. Now, when I'm asked to do the pitch, I've got to come up with five ideas. And right now, I don't have five ideas for the core methodology. The core methodology, I know I've been bored you guys to death, but... We had a gold stock set up. Okay, let's go with this gold stock. Didn't trigger. We had another gold stock set up. Didn't trigger. Before those two, we had weeks and weeks of nothing to do. Why? Well, the market just wasn't cooperating. And more importantly, the database wasn't producing anything meaningful. So when I went into the show today, I had to come up with some ideas. And I knew I wouldn't have any core methodology ideas, meaning the short to intermediate term stock trading. So one of the things I threw out was S&P spiders because you have a two, in this case, 30 EMA breakout. And all you're looking for there is two bars of Landry Light above the 30 EMA, and then you get long above those two bars. Now, this could be a little bit of a noisy system, but it's a conceptually correct system, and it can work fairly well, even in an efficient, I'm sorry, even in an efficient market like the S&P 500. And it's something I mess around with a little bit. It could work really well, and something inefficient like the smaller crypto. Now, when we get to the live charts, we'll take a look at Bitcoin, and it's set up right now as a 2 230 EMA breakout. We'll take a look at that too. So, daily chart looking okay with the Landry Light. The weekly chart is not so good. You can see mostly red in there for quite some time. But back to George's question. Yeah, it's still a longer term downtrend, but notice we are getting back above this prior little low in here. And then the other thing to remember is markets rarely set up in a textbook fashion, like you'll see in Schaubacher, Edwards and McGee, and more modern classic, so to speak, like Pring, technical analysis explained, and uh, Murphy's. 
book. I forget. I think he changed the name of his book to Visual Investor. I think I might have the original copy of the the, the older one. But anyway, those people, uh, Edwards and McGee, Schaubacher, and in more recent times, when I say more recent, you know, geez, I'm getting old, 40 years ago or more, you got Pring and Murphy. But they rarely set up in a textbook fashion. So usually what will happen is they'll overshoot. And you can see we've overshot here, this low here. We've taken that low out and then the reversal happens. So it looks like, aha, the market's breaking down. We've had a pile on a short. And then what the market did, it went right back up. So anyway, getting back to the Landry light, notice we had some red on the weekly. We had some more red on the weekly. So almost this whole year was red. Now we did have this fake out green signal up here. And that's when I didn't see this as a TFM 10% buy on the weekly cash, but it was because this low was actually greater than the moving average. Had I paid attention to this little illustrator down here, as I like to call indicators, this is just an illustrator, I would have seen that, aha, we do have Landry light. However, as I've said a thousand times, it, it wasn't within the designer's intent. My intent was to build a trend following system that bought on strength, not on weakness. So in a case like this, I'd say, no, I think I'm gonna wait before buying in. And I don't want to tweak it now since it's been out for a few years. I want to leave it as it is. But maybe a new improved version would be in or above the two bar high, like you're playing a, like I want to say 220, but it's like, like a 230 EMA breakout. If you Google 220 EMA breakout or just go to my YouTube channel, I've got plenty of videos on the 230 EMA breakout is what I use now. But you'll see a lot of videos on, on that little pattern. So the entry, Maybe a new improved entry would be above a two bar high. Maybe I'll play around with that. I played around with some of this stuff, and longer term, it doesn't really make that big of a difference. Shorter term, you feel like, damn, you know, I just got whipsawed here. But longer term, it doesn't make a huge difference. And as I've said before, you start putting a lot of lot of um, whipsaw filters in, you're going to start curve fitting, and you're going to get in a lot of trouble trying to trade that curve fitted system. And believe me, I've done programming for system designers way back in the day and 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 I was guilty too you know your holy grail hunting and the, what if we put in a moving average to to keep keep us from buying in a bear market or what if we do this or what if we do that and after a while it begins a curve fit and as I think I've said before I'd much rather have a mediocre system that's conceptually correct and works over time than some G whiz system that was the greatest thing since sliced bread and I would never throw anybody under the bus, but one of my clients did point out to me there's a certain individual out there comes out with a system de jour, actually a system de month, and he sells it to you for $995, and it's the greatest system ever, but next month he has an even greater system. It's like, well, what happened to that system you had last month is, is my question. But anyway, <laughs> all right, let's shift gears and go to crypto. And if you guys want to look at any crypto in particular, obviously I'll look at the big ones. George says price is king. Amen. Price is king. Okay. No matter what indicator you're using or what system you're using, always look at price and always start with the net net price movement. So here's Ethereum. I just so happen to have landed on it. You got bar one, you got bar two. If you wanted to trade, if you're anxious to jump in on Ethereum, worrying worried that you might have missed this last bottom. You have time. You can get it around 1600 plus a little wiggle room. Let's say 1640, okay? Would be a good buy area for Ethereum. In fact, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put a lorem in for that and I'll buy some. I'll play along with you if that happens for S&Gs. Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Now, the last 230 EMA buy signal kind of failed miserably, as you can see. So. I want to do something that a trader has never done is show you a trade that didn't work, okay? But now that Bitcoin has based out for a while and now we're beginning to see a breakout, I think this is a more valid system if that's something you want to do. Now, I do have some Bitcoin and I hate to admit it, but I have a little hodled, not enough to hit me with a $5 wrench, so don't 
and I don't know. <laughs> I've kind of protected myself from it just for S and G's, but I don't know my my 20 um, keyword phrase or anything, so don't come after me on that. Oh, look, we have a new day just started. So let's add an alert, Bitcoin around 21,000 and change, 21.2. So bar one, bar two, plus a little wiggle room. So a good, good entry for Bitcoin if you want to play that Bitcoin would be that. George has stopped in the 30. Yeah. So the beauty of this little system is, and I wouldn't rush out and put your life savings in it, but it can be kind of cool. And, you know, you can look at this point here and say, okay, bar one, bar two, enter it with a little wiggle room. That did work out pretty good initially, and then Bitcoin crashed back down. I forgot what, I forgot what caused this crash. It doesn't matter, okay? But it, something caused it to crash down. And by the way, look at that moving average, how jagged, okay? That's what I was trying to explain earlier. As soon as price moves below, it turns down. As soon as price moves above, it moves up. And that's why you've got that jagged moving average, in, even in the 30 EMA. And that's why that simple, more slow to rise and fall 10 actually has a nice little relationship with that 30 EMA. But anyway, let's say you did take this trade back here. And let's say you got in at, what's that, 21, 21.970. It did run. I don't know if it ran all the way up here. It ran to 22.95, 9.53. So maybe you could have squeezed out some partial profits. I don't know. It doesn't look like a big enough move to me. I would count that as a failed trade. But maybe you could have raise your stop a little bit must no stop always for position size i'm not sure what you can you rephrase so ethereum looking pretty good bitcoin looking pretty good let's check like shiba shiba you knew she was not quite there okay let's just wait on this one and see what happens it's been a while since you had a 230 on this one but hey look back here i don't know if i played it or not but you know, two bars plus some wiggle run, maybe it would have got you in this big fat bar here. That looked like a pretty good run. I know some of you guys were getting excited about it back then. Elon, Elon setting up as a, with today's action, let's see what happens, but it's setting up as a possible buy. I think I have a 75 million, 100 million shares left for this. <laughs> I did some crypto mining, so to speak, where I would take all my profits or a portion. I take like 50 bucks a trade. And back then I was doing a lot of trade. And so a lot of money went into this. And I would leave that 50 bucks in that coin and I'd move it over to a different account, a different part of the account where I couldn't trade it without moving it back, of course. And I'm like, I'm going to let it sit there for a year and see what happens. And it, it has failed miserably, I'll tell you that. So if you look at some of those older videos, when I said, hey, check back in a year, just know that, it, it, that it's uh, failed miserably. To construct a trade, I need to know the risk equals stop. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. And if you get the spreadsheet, which you have access to, George, and I think everybody else, I think it's not behind a firewall. I'm pretty sure it's not, but it's it's definitely under members' resources on my website. And you get a tracking spreadsheet, and you can punch all this stuff in, figure out how much you should risk based on your account size, or how much you want to risk on a trade. All right, anybody want to, any other crypto you want to look at? Let me just show you real quick. When this crypto market gets to moving, oh, by the way, uh, one thing that I learned last week at Bandcamp, last week at Charcon, or two weeks ago at Charcon, is Greg Schnell was bullish on Bitcoin with, with the S&P as a trigger. So I'd be interested to check back with him to see where he is now. But his point is, as the S&P improves, that means risk on, people are coming back into the market, so speculation is alive and well, then maybe look to Bitcoin too as another speculative area. As I've shown many times before, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it, but from my standpoint, unfortunately, Bitcoin pretty much follows stocks. You plot the S&P and you plot Bitcoin underneath, they pretty much, for the most part, they do diverge every now and then, but for the most part, they look the same. So Having a little Bitcoin huddled, hidden away, I thought, hey, I have this spare money or whatever, should the shit hit the fan. And no, it does you no good. So as I preach, every asset class will lose half its value at some point in your lifetime. And that's not an original thought, by the way, but it's true. As I've said a bazillion times, when a market is blowing and going and running, all you have to do is sort by percent change. Now the day just changed, so it's kind of mucking up my charts. 
but you start by a percent change and just buy the strongest ones. Right now, it's not one of those markets. Oh, that, that looks kind of interesting. That's a 230 EMA right there. So I think I think the 230 EMA does show some promise. And uh, this is this shouldn't be in here. This is a stock. But it does show some promise in Bitcoin, although that was a 230 EMA breakout. Might be might be interesting to follow. And there's a stock too. We'll get that out of there. Anyway, uh, okay, no questions of Bitcoin. Let's shift gears. Let's go to stocks. And then what we'll do is uh, open it up for individual stock picks. I know we we talk about stocks all all day long in Facebook, but somebody who's not in the Facebook group, let's get this changed to TC. Okay. So let's take a look at the at the major MIGs, and then we'll drill down to some sector action and maybe take a look at bonds and some other stuff. Okay. Okay, S&P 500, obviously today tried to rally, came back in. And the other thing is, we're probably going to see some follow through to the downside. That's okay. This low was the lowest level since way back here. George was saying what happens below the low, or I think that's what he was alluding to. Well, anybody who bought stocks from here on up or, any, or above, anywhere above here, if we go to the low, you got this whole mountain of supply up here, okay? And as I preach, quoting Tom McClellan's late mother Marion, some people buy when they hey, have money, some people sell when they need money. And obviously, I mean, everything's so damn expensive nowadays. If that market begins to drop and they're losing money in the market on top of all the money they're losing from inflation and higher prices and slower business, et cetera, that's going to put more pressure on them. I know I've just kind of confused the issue with facts, but I think it's okay to have that kind of framework in the back of your mind. And that possible trigger for that could be if we take out this low with bigger. My gut is if we took out that low, it would be the mother of all fake outs like we saw last time. But who knows? The market rarely makes it that easy for you. Like, aha, it faked out last time. I'm going to be ready the next time. And guess what? The next time it doesn't fake out. NASDAQ got whacked a little in here, as you can see, down a little bit more percent and a half. Shorter term, it's kind of basing now. You back the chart out a little bit, though. It does have a little bit of the witch hat characteristic to it. The good news is we kind of had that double bottom where this bottom's a little bit lower than that one. That's what I was alluding to earlier is that they never really perfectly set up. Usually you have a, a bottom that stops short of the other one or takes the other one out, making everybody think it's the end of the world, and then comes back. And those are my favorites. So if this market really comes back, then we've got a really good fake out in place longer term. Again, I'm not getting bullish on you, okay? Longer term, there's a weekly chart. Connect your highs, okay? And there's probably never been a, an easier time in history to connect your highs and see that it, just a, a plain old generic trend line will show you that we have falling tops still in here. But as I preach, and as I think I said in the weekly charts, you got to start somewhere. So if the market has is right around where it was several months ago and higher than it was a couple of weeks ago, then maybe it's beginning to bottom out. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Now the Rusty has been a little bit of an outperformer and it's also a bit of a more textbook double bottom as you can see. So, so far that has held and so far it's doing pretty good. And it's actually above the 50 day simple moving average. If you guys wanna look at some individual stocks, you could do, you could start asking now. Let's take a look at gold. Gold remains in a longer term downtrend, as you can see. It has been kind of bottoming out a little bit shorter term, but I, I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet. Now, I see a lot of people getting bullish on gold. I think they're right, but early. Erin was was kind of bullish on gold earlier today. I think she's right, but early, as I said in the webinar. Bonds, pretty serious downtrend. So far, just pulling back. Glad to see them bounce a little bit. Boy, I tell you, about a week ago, we didn't think, geez, this is crazy. My wife said, you know, mortgages are like 7%. I'm like, no way, you're crazy. And then uh, lo and behold, mortgages are 7%. Isn't that crazy? Energies on a real strength basis doing really good, breaking out to multi-month highs. As you can see, it just shot these all-time highs. I didn't really trust them when they made this big run higher and stalled out, you know, because I was worried they would stall out. 
And the reason is because by the time the market's all the way back up here, it's overbought. And if you don't believe me, go in and look at the archives, davidlander.com slash archives. And every night I tell you what I think, at least tell my clients what I think in the nightly service. And you can go and look at those archives and, and see what I thought. And, and hey, you know, I'm not the grand poobah. I'm wrong a lot. I'm wrong a lot more than I'd like to be. I took a personality test and I found out that I'm very low in agreeableness. I told my wife and daughters, they looked at me like I pooed in my pants. <laughs> I thought it was a big epiphany for me. It's the worst possible trade you could have for trading. I like being right. Don't play Monopoly with me either. Uh, I think it's ugly. <laughs> My family won't play Monopoly with me. Financials, you can see they're stalling out a little bit right at that 50 day. The 50 seems to be a little bit of resistance for a lot of these areas. Biotech's kind of all over the place, but it did get above the 50 day moving average. On a relative basis, biotech's doing pretty good. On an absolute basis, it is, it is still it is still kind of sideways in here. She would like to see some follow through to the upside. Transports not looking so hot, kind of stalling out close to their 50, but they did pull back past this prior little base in here. So that's certainly a positive. Soft, software is another one of those areas that pulled, uh, pulled back past its prior little base, okay? So I wouldn't see this as a big of a short as something like, unfortunately, the semiconductors which really didn't get too far below or back above their prior little bottom or base, whatever you want to call it in here. So semiconductor still looking pretty ugly. Biotech looking better on a relative strength basis. Software kind of bottoming out. The dollar has begun to crack a little in here, and I use this as a possible short uh, by putting a 30 EMA in this. You can go in and watch uh, the pitch for today. And today, just for reference, is October 27th. All right, yeah, let's open up for individual stocks, SLV. Now, silver is looking better than gold, but silver could be a really erratic market and really choppy. It's it, kind of Jackie Mason. You know, I guess my new way of saying that is an Aussie man. Yeah, nah, yeah, nah, yeah, nah, yeah, you know? So, yes, it's improving, but I would be careful here. Ideally, you want to see it take out, let's say, 1930 or something and start looking a little better and you got a little overhead supply to deal with so i wouldn't call a bottom there just yet but it is bottoming and sometimes as you know bottoms can be a process all right any more anything else you guys want to talk about well obviously i want to thank all you guys and girls for attending if there's anything unanswered bring it up in facebook and if you're not a member of the facebook group which you have to be a gold member at least of davelander.com you can reach me at davelander.com slash contact. And you could also leave a comment on the YouTube version of this. And I will answer all comments that need answering. <laughs> Some girl said something about making $20,000. And uh, obviously, it's somebody being a little spammy, I could tell. And uh, I almost said trading or on OnlyFans. But um I resisted that temptation. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Everybody have a great weekend. And all you guys and girls that are in uh, the Facebook group, I'll see you guys and girls tomorrow. Thank you so much. And may the trend be with you. You're welcome.